Hello and welcome to our very first podcast at Elm Institute. My name's Chris, and today we're going to be talking everything biodiversity. What is it? Why should you care? With us today is Dr. Peter Bickerton, who's one of our longtime collaborators on our articles and features. Um, Pete, thanks for joining us today. Could you give us a little bit of a background into what are you doing? Cheers, Chris. Well, at the moment, I'm the lead plant scientist for AgriLution, so we're a, a company based in Munich, and we make a hydroponics plant cube to bring vertical farming into the kitchen. That sounds pretty cool. Um, you, uh, I've heard you talk quite a lot about um, vertical farming. Um, do you want to just give us a quick introduction to what that is and why it's useful, why humanity needs that, why it's a cool idea? Well, the idea is, since the 1950s, you can see that people are living mainly in cities now. So whereas in 1950, most of the world lived in the countryside, now and by 2050, the majority of the world population will live in cities. And we're already encroaching onto our biodiversity in the wild with our current agricultural system. And it's not sustainable. So one way we can combat that is by growing food up and in cities and where we need it. So hopefully one day all, all companies and any, any tall building will have something like that in it. Um, well, yeah, you can build it in. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be a, a farm in its own right. Yeah. What we're trying to do is kind of democratise it. So yeah. imagine in, in any new development in your kitchen, you have a fridge, you have a freezer, and you have a plant cube. That'd be pretty cool. That sounds great. I think certainly when, uh, when I next move, I'll, I'll try and get something like that in. Uh, it sounds pretty exciting. Um, so you've mentioned biodiversity, which is, which is great because that's the theme of um, uh, today's podcast. And I hear that you've uh, written a poem on biodiversity. Yeah, in two weeks I'm giving a poem at Thought for Food called On Biodiversity We Live or Die, which is quite relevant to the conversation we're going to have today, I think. I'm an ambassador for Thought for Food, but I think it's good to bring home the point that biodiversity is one of the most important things. So all this technology is useful, but if we don't preserve what we've got around us, then we're not, the technology will be useless. I know that probably quite a few people have heard the word biodiversity uh, before, or biological diversity, or some, or some form of it, but perhaps not everybody um, understands fully what it means, or the different ways um, that actual biologists um, and environmental scientists think about it or use the term. Um, could you just give us a quick overview of biodiversity from a scientist's point of view? From the most basic explanation, so you can do a biodiversity index, right? So the most basic level, you've got lots of different animals, plants, bacteria, fungi, all sorts of stuff on the planet, and there's lots of them. So biodiversity is how many different types there are, and also how much of each one there is. So you've got species richness, which is the number of different types of animal, plants, yeah. fungi, bacteria. So obviously biodiversity is kind of a combination of the number of individuals of the same type and all the different types. So obviously a rainforest, for example, is teeming with life. It's very biodiverse because there's tons, there's loads of different species. So in yeah. Colombia, there's like 10% of all of the different types of animal, plant on earth. Whereas a wheat field in Norfolk is possibly the least biodiverse. <laughs> part of the planet. I mean, obviously we need, <laughs> we need wheat to, to, to eat, um, but it's the, the actual health of the biodiversity across the world and all sorts of ecosystems that you can find it in um, is, is pretty crucial, I guess, to life. Why is it that important to have biodiversity? I think it was put into perspective of it. Do you see the news story recently with the wolves that introduced some wolves to a national park? In yes, America. yes, yes. So the, all these big animals have a really important role. It's like in the sea with cod fisheries and tuna and all these yeah. big predators and stuff. So this, the minute you take out something like such as a wolf or an elephant from a landscape, then the landscape changes. So wolves eat deer. And if you have too many deer, then it's good to have deer, but not to have too many deer. <laughs> so if you have too many deer, they eat lots of bark, they eat trees, they eat graze, which leaves very little room for wildflowers to grow. You don't get proper forest development. And then suddenly you've got lots of deer and not much else. As soon as you introduce some wolves into that system, the wolves are eating the deer, which reduces the deer populations, which increases the populations of sort of local flowers and trees and things, which increases the population of other species which eat those flowers and trees. Which And then there's a more fine balance and stuff, which brings actually more predators into the park. So when biodiversity is, is damaged or threatened, is it this is it this balance that then becomes uh, the issue and is the, the balance of it that gets threatened? It is about balance. Nature's a very finely balanced thing. So, I mean, think about all of our nutrient cycling. Everything that we produce, what does a wheat plant require? It requires soil, 
humans can't make so we can't invent soil so it's a natural it's a natural thing right a wheat plant needs soil it needs sunlight it needs oxygen it needs nitrogen phosphorus where do all these things come from they come from biodiversity not just the animals and plants and stuff yeah, yeah the birds fly over the field they excrete that falls in the field whatever the earthworms churn it up the bacteria fix the nitrogen everything that we do to feed ourselves to survive requires biodiversity in all of its forms it requires a balanced ecosystem so i know that there's not not a huge amount of biodiversity in um in, in england in terms of the actual number of species not particularly in the whole of europe actually if you compare it to some of the biodiversity hotspots um, around the world um, one of those um hot spots or a particular type of hot spot that crops up quite often um is rainforests do you have any experience of rainforests I've been to the rainforest in ecuador could you tell us a little bit about it's a very nice what's place it, what's it like it's beautiful we went well it's actually quite interesting as far as biodiversity goes yeah i mean i think there's probably we did this with a project on bromeliads so bromeliads are like, like a pineapples of bromeliad it's a plant so we looked at the ones that grow in trees so these are plants that don't need soil to survive they grow up in the branches of trees and they're kind of like a self-contained ecosystem it was amazing so we studied the, the diversity of animal life in bromeliad plants and i'm pretty sure we found as many species of insects in 10 bromeliads as you might be able to find in an entire <laughs> countryside scene in the united kingdom yeah, it was ridiculous we crazy. had too many species to count actually but yeah it's very it's noticeable the amount of obscure life that you find in these places but that's kind of a matter of the closer you get to the equator the warmer it gets the more diversity you find why is that the case then that the sort of warmer you get um that you get more biodiversity i think it's the conditions for life to us but if you think about the sea i mean it's all about how minerals are accessible to life in general so the conditions are harsher <laughs> the colder it gets if that makes sense yes i mean there's still strains to life in the rainforest for example there's not much salt in the rainforest so my favorite animal in the world is actually called the sweat bee because <laughs> there's such little salt in the rainforest because there's so many so much life there that's taking it on but there's these animals which go around and they don't sting the stingless bees and they go and find mammals and they suck the sweat off the skin that's, so that's, that's unbelievable. Yeah. I remember actually watching um, a documentary a little while back, and, and it was of some, uh, I can't remember whereabouts in the world it was, definitely rainforest, and there were some elephants, and they would trek for ages, for miles, to, to this certain cave complex, this open cave. Um, it's quite a big cave, obviously, there were a herd of elephants going into it. Um, and the reason they went there was to sort of lick the walls for the salt. It's amazing how life finds a way, right? <laughs> it is. You, could, you know, you couldn't be, um, you know, if I was was tasked to find salt in a rainforest I probably wouldn't have thought of that so it's you know it, it is it is um it is amazing I think sometimes so now not all rainforests and not all areas on earth that have this wonderful bio biodiversity not everything is um quite so rosy all the time obviously you've mentioned things like deforestation um and things like agriculture um but all these can um affect biodiversity um could you tell us a little bit about the things that um, are threatening biodiversity. I think you've named most of them. So the big ones are agriculture, the way we feed ourselves, which kind of combines all facets of what you hear in the news, climate change. That's one side of it, but also borders are pretty a big, a big issue as well. Because we carve up the landscape. So it, it might be for fields, for growing crops, which by the way, we grow in massive, we grow single crops in fields, which isn't great for biodiversity because you've only got one type of plant. And we talked before about how it's important to have a mixture of different animals and plants in a, in a So it's things like, um, almost, so basically our, our entire agricultural system on earth to feed humans, um, it, it does tend to be quite monoculture focused, yeah. uh, which is, you know, almost the opposite definition of biodiversity. So, so what happens then when you get things like diseases and droughts or floods in the in these systems that rely on a very very few number of sort of staple crops and things well, that's a big problem i mean we kind of work on that sort of thing here so <laughs> if you have one type of plant and you have one disease which happens to affect that plant then if, it, if every single one of those plants is the same they're all going to die from that disease there's no getting around it that's why we need not only diversity in the type of plant but also in its genetics so in how that plant is made so if up. we could somehow make our own agricultural system far more biodiverse it would it would it would help to maybe not solve some of those issues that we face but it would certainly go towards create an environment um, that is i guess 
more resilient? It's a hard balance to strike because we need to feed a certain amount of people and the current system of doing things works. <laughs> so it, it produces a lot of food. Hmm. But it's ways of kind of combining that with preserving biodiversity. So, I mean, we've already got some, you know, you can leave environmental borders around your fields and that sort of thing, which increases the amount of biodiversity around your fields. That's one way of going about it. Yeah. We need biodiversity within agriculture as well as biodiversity external to that, if that makes sense. Yeah. So a lot of people will say, don't eat meat, meat's bad for the planet. Or a lot of people say, don't eat soybean because soybean's bad for the planet. Or we just don't eat too much of each different thing. If we have a diversity within our agricultural systems, that can help maintain the biodiversity outside of that as well. I know that lots of um, sort of breakthroughs either in the pharmaceutical industry or, 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 or any sort of medical clinical um, application through drugs and things like that. Lots of the, the compounds and the, the active ingredients in a lot of drugs um, over the last hundred years really particularly um, come from areas of great biodiversity like rainforests. Yep. Um, so it's 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 no I guess it's no exaggeration to say that as the, you know the more of these areas that we destroy the less of an opportunity there's going to be available for discovering potentially revolutionary compounds to help in new medicines to keep us alive I guess it's a great point yeah I mean think about the number of plants we don't even know exist even though we're destroying the rainforest at a crazy rate and we've explored quite a lot of the world we still don't know what lies in those plants what secrets they've got what about the sort of cultural effects that biodiversity can have? Because obviously, I mean, you've, you've been to a rainforest, you've been to a country that, that has a lot of rainforest there. Um, it, I mean, I can, I can imagine it being a fantastic place to visit, but can you just tell us what, what it feels like to visit a rainforest in terms of, uh, apart from the science for a change, how does it feel as an environment to be in? What's it, what's it like? Is it as magical as all these documentaries and things make out? It's interesting actually, because a lot of rainforest isn't as pristine as you'd think it would be watching Earth or planet Earth or something. Mm. So humans have lived in the rainforest for thousands and thousands and millions of years. Uh, so not, there's not a lot of it that's untouched by humans mm. in that regard. So the word primary rainforest you'll hear quite a lot. I mean, yeah, that's pretty much, you get pristine rainforest, but a lot of the cases humans have been using it but you can see like firsthand how a better use of land so you'll have a banana plantation in a little clearing of trees mm. which then bananas are weird to grow so you have to move your plantation every year yeah. to go with the bananas but um but you can see how that it works so they'll clear a bit of land and then that'll be used for a while and they'll move on somewhere else and that'll grow back so it's a much more sensible use of the land area rather than just clearing everything out. Mm. But there was the juxtaposition of like being in the environment of the proper rainforest, living with a you know a group of people in a tribe who would farm the traditional way, compared to <laughs> twenty miles down the road, where either side of the road there was just logs lining the road yeah, yeah. and plantations being cleared for cattle and things. So it was actually a big juxtaposition. It was kind of sad, actually, because on the one hand. We got a canoe. We canoed into the rainforest, then through this pristine rainforest. It was like that sound of howling monkeys going. Rah! Just have to jump in and uh, stop pee for a second here and um, demonstrate what actual howling monkeys sound like. Couldn't sleep for the noise, like toucans going. Like, the noises of like birds and wildlife. Couldn't go swimming in that bit of the river because there were snakes in it. Anacondas and stuff sneaking about. Mm. It's kind of an exciting world, but then I think we found out the year later, after we'd had to get a two hour canoe ride into this mm. clearing in the rainforest, now there's a road that goes there. Is there anything else you want to add about biodiversity before before we wrap up? Um, I think we've covered we've covered sort of food and sort of health benefits, covered the culture of it as well. I think a good point is that one thing that we should do is appreciate it. And it's one thing watching a David Attenborough show on your TV screen, but it's another going out and seeing it. So if you actually go out to your national trust or whatever, or if you go out on safari in Kenya, not shooting things, actually appreciating them, that puts money into the bioeconomy, which puts money into biodiversity research, which mm. puts money into conservation. So actually having an appreciation for biodiversity and going and appreciating it, it might be at your local RSPB reserve in Leighton Moss, 
or it might be on holiday if you go to a different country don't just go and see a museum of whatever go and see a local nature reserve actually national put park, money yeah. put money in national parks and they do their best to help conserve these things because the thing is I guess it all comes full circle because the healthier biodiversity is through things like partic- particularly ecotourism which is a big theme um, for the UN's International Day of Biological Diversity this year yes um, is that the, the the more money that comes in through that, that obviously goes into supporting and keeping healthy and protecting biodiversity but then we get all the benefits of that we get that to support our agricultural system and we get the, the, the potential health benefits through well, one just being around biodiversity which a lot of people feel makes their increase their well-being um, uh, as, as well as actually having you know, better pollinators better systems of the air cycle and water cycle and things like that so it massively benefits us directly so this isn't just something to protect just for the sake of protecting it it's certainly not the case what do you and just to end on what do you think biodiversity will be like in say 50 years time 100 years time at the current rate we're going you'll be eating jellyfish instead of sushi well instead of fish because there'll be no fish left there'll be fish but they won't be able to eat much of it I mean it's already getting harder and harder to find fish which suggests that we should stop doing it for a while to let them recover but that's not going to happen Yeah. but the problem is how do we get around it because population's rapidly expanding so we've got to look at I mean we've got to hope that movements like the vertical farming movement and sustainability movements win through and I think they are if you think about I think most I think a lot enough people know the issues so maybe do something about it yeah and humans usually act in their own survival interest eventually. So <laughs> I think, I mean, if you look at like innovative companies like, I don't know, like Tesla and people like that, I think there's enough people there to force through the change that we need to at least preserve enough of what we have. Yeah. That's a nice thought to end on. And that about wraps it up for today's episode. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. Uh, thanks for Pete for coming in. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about biodiversity, you can, of course, have a look on our website. That's www.erland.ac.uk. Don't forget to like and subscribe and to follow us on social media. And until next time, we'll see you later. <laughs>